All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, depending on which time zone you're in. So glad that you could drop into our LinkedIn Live today. My name is Scott Kirzner. I'm CEO and co-founder of InnoLead. Uh, I'm here with Shannon Lucas. Uh, always really fun to have a conversation with Shannon. She is the CEO of Catalyst Constellations. Um, just a little bit about InnoLead. All we do 365 days a year is focus on advancing the practice of innovation inside large organizations. And that's for people in roles like design, new products, emerging technology, growth, open innovation. Um, we love to run online events like this one today, as well as in-person events. Uh, we have one coming up in May in Silicon Valley called Leveraging AI to Create Business Value. Uh, we also do an annual conference called Impact in Boston every fall. And uh, you can learn about our online and offline events at innolead.com slash events. Shannon Lucas, uh, who's with us today, uh, as I mentioned, is CEO of Catalyst Constellations. It is a change accelerator that leverages research-driven insights and executive experience to catalyze innate change makers uh, so that they can build future-proof companies uh, Shannon is also co-author of the book, Move Fast, Break Shit, Burn Out, The Catalyst Guide to Working Well. Uh, she's been an executive vice president at Ericsson, a senior innovation architect at Cisco and director of innovation at Vodafone, which I think is where Shannon and I first met uh, in that role many eons ago. Um, Catalyst, I should mention, also runs a series called Catalyzing Organizational Change, and that's a six-week experiential course that is designed to enhance the skills of innate change makers. The next one of those starts later this month. Um, I'm excited for this conversation, and I would love to um, hear in the comments where you're logging in from. Maurizio already says that he's joined us from Italy, so tell us where you are logged in from. You can also mention someone in a comment if you think they'd be interested in joining us live or catching the replay. So just put an at sign and their name in a comment and LinkedIn uh, will do us the favor of sending them a little alert. So Shannon and I started fleshing out some of these ideas around minimalist innovation and also maximalist innovation earlier this year. Um, she has some slides to help us get the conversation going, but my role is going to be to jump in every once in a while and ask questions, uh, maybe ask Shannon to clarify or drill down into some things. But I also am going to be here as your representative asking the questions that you're posting in the chat. So Shannon, I'm so glad you could join us today. I'm going to bring up your slides and let's get rolling because I'm really excited about this topic today. Me too. Thank you for the amazing introduction, Scott. It's a mutual admiration society. When I found what was Innovation Leader back in the day, I was like, these are my people. And I've been a member for years and just always enjoy all of your events. So um, if you haven't signed up for InnoLead or you want to attend, one, you're thinking about attending an event, you should definitely do that. I am also excited about the power of minimalist uh, innovation today because <clears throat> we've been hearing a lot these days about doing more with less, which is really where this comes from. But I want to take a little bit of a step back. Uh, in 2020, after I left Ericsson, uh, Tracy and I started doing Catalyst Constellations full time. And as you can imagine, it was a pretty interesting time for people who had already been talking about the fact that the world was volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. That was a term that I had been using for years. It comes out of the US military in the 1980s to describe our post-Cold War situation. And I spent over a decade trying to convince leaders that this was something that they needed to pay attention to. Innovation wasn't just a sort of theater exercise. Companies were getting more and more disrupted. Fast forward to 2020, and of course, we collectively experienced the magnitude of what this volatile and uncertain world looks like. Obviously, there was COVID, uh, the murder of George Floyd, there was more climate impact. Then when we were catching our breath, there was the war in U Ukraine. You guys lived this. I don't, I don't need to tell you. Like VUCA became something that everyone was like, yes, we, we understand, right? By mid-2022, you know, we had seen some inflationary pressures before that. And even though that started to pivot, what we started to see the fallout of after that was a whole bunch of layoffs, as an example. All of this is to say, in the past couple of years, it's been really hard for leaders, even really experienced 
experienced leaders with lots of tenure to understand how to navigate this sort of never normal world, this need for constant reinvention. Uh, in January, we asked the members of our uh, Catalyst Executive Mastermind that we call the Catalyst Leadership Trust, what topics they wanted to focus on this year. And the number one response was leading innovation through uncertainty and ambiguity. And so in February, we did just that. Now you have to understand, again, these are C-level leaders from some of the world's largest organizations. They have the track record, but they are still trying to learn and wrap their head around like, and, and get the knowledge of insights is how do we lead through this constantly changing environment? Another thing that we saw was that the percentage of companies that were going, were, the percentage of companies that have been going through leadership shakeups is really high. And we come back to this theme of increasingly companies are being asked to do more with less. What we saw last year with both our Catalyst Leadership Trust, but also some of our other corporate clients is they were leaning into growth still and transformation and innovation. And so outside of the CLT, we were hearing companies talk about we need to return to fundamentals. We need to get back to the foundation. We need to be doing more with less. Now, as an innovator, <laughs> that should, if not cause fear, be concerning for us because one of the first things on the chopping block usually when we start talking about doing more with less or layoffs or reductions in budget can be the catalyst team, I mean, sorry, the innovation team. And what adds to the complexity of all of this is we can't even use some of the words that we've normally used, like change is a dirty word now, right? Transformation, innovation can be dirty words. It doesn't mean, though, that we don't have to stop dealing with them. We can't stick our head in the sand and be like, well, I can just ignore the change or stop transforming or innovating. And so for us as innovation leaders, we're largely the ones that have to do the pivot, the reflection. How are we going to take our, our, you know, our companies on the journey of continuing to find new ways to adapt and grow uh, while navigating this new reality of doing more with less? And so that's what brings us to the interesting conversation that Scott and I had earlier this year, which is about minimalism in innovation. So I'm going to take a minute to sort of share a little bit about my background because the, the, the work that I've done obviously informs you know, the perspective today. Um, as Scott mentioned, uh, I got the amazing opportunity as the enterprise innovation program was being built out in Vodafone back in the day to help build that from the ground up. Uh, and the hypothesis we were using then was even though three out of the four of us were based in Silicon Valley, one in the mothership in the UK, we're like, we don't want to create an ivory tower of innovation. And so the hypothesis was what happens if we find the positive troublemakers, the disruptors, around the globe, because Vodafone's truly global, and stop reinventing the wheel, first and foremost, by connecting them, giving them a shared language, shared tool set, shared training, removing the barriers for them, um, and actually amplify the work that, that they're doing. Fast forward four years, we were successful by really any metric of innovation, tens of millions of in-year revenue, uh, year four, over 500 million in pipeline, new products to market, uh, we completely changed the face of who we were talking to from IT and procurement to the C-suite. We ran over 100 C-level uh, innovation programs. Customers that went through our programs, Vodafone saw a 12% annual recurring revenue uplift. Like all of the metrics were there. We were successful. And I was really naive in my success because I, I was troubleshooting this one problem, which was the innovation champion program at that point had grown to over 100 certified innovation champions but they weren't all showing up the same way. So I will come back to that story later, a little cliffhanger. Um, the next hypothesis though, while I was at Vodafone, um, we were doing a lot of great things, but I was working on this massive project across Africa with one of our partners, Thomson Reuters, trying to build on top of M-Pesa, which I'll talk about later, to, uh, to bring financial inclusion to smallholder farmers. And there just wasn't the mechanism for Vodafone to be able to do that at the time. So the hypothesis that I went to Cisco with is, well, what if you had one of the world's best corporate venture capital for, you know, arms uh, behind you with arguably the strongest track record of spin outs and spin ins? And, and that's Cisco, clearly. Uh, while I was there, I both catalyzed uh, blockchain initiatives, co-creating with the likes of GE, uh, DB Schenker, Intel, Citibank. Uh, and also worked on some uh, oncology projects. And we got a number of spin-outs. We got some internal pro products. Again, 
successful, but wanted to see the next hypothesis, which was, what does it look like if you own the PL? And so when Ericsson reached out and I got the opportunity to run the emerging business team, a $150 million PL focused on non-traditional players, the hyperscale cloud players and, um, and the industrials. What does that look like? Um, and so we laid a lot of foundation, uh, crushed the revenue, and also did the foundational work for a couple billion dollar acquisitions. So that's hey, the Shannon, background. Can I, yeah. can I just jump in here before you get into the next slide and say, yeah. you talked about leadership changes a little earlier in your introduction. Um, in your experience, is leadership change kind of one of the things that has kind of um, you know led to de-emphasis or led to changes in your career? Yeah, hundred percent. I was just talking with a, a chief transformation officer this morning, and that was that was part of the thing that we were talking about. Is like the person who brings you in, and and I was going to talk about this later, but you become the shiny object of that person, and you are the embodiment often of the hope that they have that they're going to have this innovation capability. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why senior leadership change, but that's one of the big things is that that there, that tight connection between those people, especially if it was positive. If it changes, can be really tough for innovation leaders. It's not impossible to navigate, but you are step, you are sort of starting over in terms of making the case and bringing them along on the capacity and, and sort of what you're doing. And I would argue on it's on us to understand, I mean, this is part of what we teach Catalyst is the slowing down, the moving fast, breaking shit, burning out is when we're not intentional. The slowing down and just being like, what does this executive care about? What are the wins for this executive? And how do I pivot to this new culture potentially that they're bringing in with them? Yeah, but that obviously can be very time intensive, right? Figuring out like, okay, let's wait for the new C-level leader to come up with their vision, their strategy, and then let me then figure out how to pivot uh, underneath that. Um, Fabian asked a question. We're going to get into definitions in a second, but do you consider frugal innovation or Jugad innovation, as Navi Raju calls it, to be part of this concept of yeah, minimalism innovation? Totally. There's there's lots of terms out there. And I think it's like the, the frugal innovation is probably the most similar. Uh, it comes with its own baggage. So I think us thinking about it in, in slightly different ways is important. But, you know, we'll talk about it, but it's the simplicity and the focus on impact. And it, and it connects with what you're saying, which is getting the quick impact without a lot of investment to make the case. And so if you have to make the case again to the new executive, the new C-suite, having those tools in your toolkit and that impact really helps. All right, let's keep rolling here. Yeah. All right. So all of this is to say, I've tried a lot of things. I've had a lot of failures. I'll talk more about one of them in a little bit. So I love the pivot as we continue. This is about innovation and there's a lot of definitions. So this is sort of my mashup definition. It's the intentional practice of developing and marketing new products and services or the improvement of existing goods and services. I'm sort of, you know, traditional new idea method or device, right? In order to understand minimalism, though, we have to understand what maximalism is. And so maximalist innovation is about embracing this the complexity and abundance as an opportunity to create new solutions. That's largely where a number of, you know, a lot of our customers have been in the past few years. It's like everyone's understood we need to invest in the ability to adapt and create change. Uh, and so the double click is it's the creation of solutions that are like feature rich and bold and designed with an emphasis on maximizing functionality and aesthetics without often the clear timelines or immediate line of sight to ROI. If we look at minimalist innovation, it's the practice of creating solutions that achieve maximum impact through simplicity and the efficient use of ex existing resources as much as possible. So it can be the approach to new solution creation aligned with this maximalist philosophy, which is what we're being asked to do right now, right? Is less is more <laughs> and advocating for the simplicity along the way, leveraging clarity and functionality and sustainability as things that you're talking about as you're bringing stakeholders along. So let's look at some examples to bring this to life. Uh, probably a lot of you are familiar with either Google X or the Moonshot Factory uh, as they're now called. Uh, a number of years ago, a decade ago, actually, in 2013, they started on Project Loon, uh, which I paid a lot of attention to because it was squarely in the telecom space. And Project Loon was, you know, use, coming up with an idea that was supposed to be low cost, 
that would connect the unconnected, like a billion people around the world that didn't have access to mobile telephony at the time. Um, in 2015, uh, one of the you know, people working on Project Loon came up with a sort of TAM of 10, a $10 billion business was their projection for what Loon was going to be capable of delivering. At some point, someone estimates that they were burning about $100 million a year. <laughs> in 2019, they got $125 million from SoftBank, and the project was shut down in 2021 doesn't mean there weren't learnings and things that they took away from it, for sure. It's not like maximalist innovation doesn't give us anything, but you can see sort of on the one hand what that might look like. I'm going to talk about, obviously, there's this is super popular, but it's such a great example. And having worked at Vodafone, I feel really deeply proud of the work that they did here. Um, this is M-Pesa. Pesa means, and Swahili means money, so mobile money. Uh, and Vodafone, who owns a substantial part of Safaricom, which is a local uh, te mobile telephony provider there, uh, they started a pilot in um, 2005. And the pilot was broadly looking at how do you provide financial services to uh, people who are on, you know, not part of the financial service system uh, and have basic telephones, if that, right? Uh, and the pilot was really interesting because they realized actually that there were some more foundational things before they got into sort of more financial inclusion from a from a financing perspective or access to capital perspective. Uh, and that was sort of the, the, the mobile transfer of money, the repatriation of money across borders or cities or towns or whatever. And so after that quick pilot, uh, DFID, which is sort of the UK version of USAID, and Vodafone each invested a million dollars, which is non-trivial, I'll say that. Um, but when you look at the scale that it got after that, so it went from pilot to a small rollout for them paying attention to things like, hey, if we give a nudge and give our users a 5% discount on buying airtime, you know, airtime minutes, the adoption goes up. If we train those agents that you see in the background there more about and pace and incentivize them, adoption goes up. So it was like really small teams paying attention to really big leverage points with really like kind of small inflections, really. Uh, so last year, the, um, the a Kenyan newspaper reported that M-Pesa transacted $277 billion through the system. That's three times the Kenyan GDP. It now operates in eight countries. Uh, and in uh, Kenya last year, the revenues were $885 million. So I'm not saying that it was only a $2 million investment. Investment. But if you look at how they scaled, there weren't massive teams, they weren't in a Silicon Valley garage, they were on the ground paying attention with small teams to how things were being used and, and shifting with little, little levers. When I love the I love the revenue uh, numbers that you shared, Shannon, because it sort of suggests that while the approach is minimalist, uh, and you may be working with limited resources, uh, the outcomes can be pretty big. That's the that's the great buildup. Thank you. So the key takeaways are here, you know, start with some hypotheses and some consumer insights. Start with a small pilot, get your learning, and then just continue to pay attention. Consider yourself almost always in pilot mode. So you're constantly paying attention to how you can increase scale. So if we pull these three things together, typical innovation sort of thinking is the more money I invest in my innovation team, the more things that come out of it, right? We think of it as a pretty linear thing. And, and innovation teams will often be like, well, we just don't have the budget. If I told you the budget for impact that we had at Vodafone, it's ridiculous, our ROI, right? Um, if you think about maximalist, <laughs> and Google Loon is an example, but there's plenty of examples of maximalist innovation out there. There's a People get stuck to the idea of the sunk cost. Well, we have to make it work because we invested one, but now you invested five. Well, now we have to make it work because we invested five. People get really afraid of like pulling the bandaid off and saying we have to stop investing in this until at some point it becomes so painfully obvious. But to your point, Scott, like for really minimal investment, if you're thinking about it the right way, you can have really maximum impact. So we're not saying that minimalist is horizon one or incremental. It's where you take it, and I would argue where the culture and the executives want you to go, <laughs> but it's the approach, and it's, it's really a shift in mindset about how we think about innovation that we're talking about here. Well, and, you know, I would sort of, I think, you know, I'm not sure I could argue with this slide, but I know if I were the, you know, if I were Astro Teller who runs the Moonshot factory at Google, I would probably say, yeah, we're high resources, but we will eventually have something out of the portfolio that is high impact. So they would want to be 
you know, in the upper right corner of this slide, you know, they would say, hey, Waymo at some point or one of their other projects. I'm not sure if they're still working on the like contact lens uh, drug Barely. delivery stuff. Yeah. You know, so they would say, look, eventually we're going to have something that is really high impact. It's just, you know, it's been 10 or 12 years and we haven't seen them create that yet. Right. And and if you're following the news, Google has been, you know, asking some hard questions about the moonshot factory right now. Uh, certainly we can look at a time horizon for lots of companies. Most companies don't have sort of patient capital. I wouldn't even argue that this is patient capital, but uh, that have the appetite for, for patient capital. Um, and we still have yet to see what those are. So, you know, if we go back, this is the definition definition. That's why I added that to the maximalist definition is with uncertain timelines and uncertain ROI, right? If you have the stomach for it and you really want to be disruptive and you have sort of unlimited funds like Google does, great. But most of us, and the reason that we're having this conversation today is most of us aren't in the moonshot factory. Most of us are in companies that are telling us that we need to do more with less, where the whole organization has already worked and innovation or change or transformation may be a dirty word. So how do we, how do we think about pivoting today to meet our reality? I just want to drill down one more level just because I know you know people in the Google ecosystem, right? Part of the rationale of creating Google X in the first place was a retention play, right? It was we have smart people that are starting to get antsy working on AdWords and Gmail and all of our core products. How do we retain those people by giving them some interesting problems and projects to work on, right? So it was somewhat about retaining smart people in the very competitive Silicon Valley ecosystem. So they didn't just leave Google and go to a competitor or leave and go to their startup. And I just think that rationale for most companies, they would not say, let's create an innovation lab and give people a playground so that they don't leave us. You know what I mean? That's not like a business well, rationale hold, for a lot of companies hold, outside hold of that Valley. thought. Hold that thought. Cause I'm going to come to some of the work that we do. And that actually is a pretty big driver for some, and it does dovetail really nicely. And uh, with the, the minimalist innovation piece, if I forget about it though, totally remind me. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, do you, Let's keep going on the pillars and then I'll bring in uh, Jan and, and Vim both have questions that we'll get to in a few minutes. Awesome. Yeah, let me let me get through like the next five slides. They'll go quickly and then it'll be a great time. So the minimalist innovation pillars like this again, this is about a mind, mind a shift in mindset. Um, it's I'm, what I'm not advocating for is the new lean startup or design thinking methodology like this is. I, sometimes I get up here, I'm like, is it common sense what we're talking about? And it, it may be, right? But just the clarity of what we need to focus on. The first piece is alignment. So if, if the goal of Google is to retain those wicked people and they'll only be interested in doing, you know, Google moonshot factory things, okay. But it's important to be aligned to where your stakeholders, that new CEO, the new C-suite are, and we'll come back to that. The next piece that this is the piece, the next piece is the piece that most people, most organizations, in my opinion, fail on. And this is part of the learnings that I'll come back to, too, which is uh, you need to pay attention to the innovation curve, which we'll look at right from the diffusions of innovation. People across the organization don't have the same relationship to change. And so we need to think about that very intentionally as we're doing any kind of innovation. And then the last piece that we're talking about is this ability to really quickly show results, um, you know, uh, demonstrate the impact so that you get even more alignment, right? I want to, this is where I want to go sideways for a minute before I go to the next slide. Uh, and you can even stop showing for a minute if you want. I'm going to go back to the Vodafone story. So the fail that I had four years in uh, was that we had those 100 innovation champions. And even though we were crushing it, the thing that I was feeling like a failure about was that I couldn't activate all of those champions the same way. And because we were so successful, I really had every tool in my toolkit. Like the CEO had three CEO awards and he saved one for our 100 person catalyst innovation, I mean, innovation team, innovation champion team, right? Uh, but no matter what lever I turned, dialed, rewards, gamified, all the things, I couldn't solve that problem. And so this is where uh, my now co-CEO and I uh, sort of intersect because I had hired an executive coach at the time, Tracy Lovejoy, my amazing co-author and co-CEO. She's an ethnographer and researcher by background, and she had been using those skills at Microsoft to help with their innovation efforts. And when she left to become an executive coach and consultant, you know, you're supposed to find your ideal customer profile, right? And as an ethnographer, she couldn't find a demographic or psychographic that described that silver thread of people that she loved working with. 
So she did an ethnographic study of her favorite clients. Happily, I was one of them. But also serendipitously, I was at the end. So she got to really like immediately share out her research on catalysts. And we'll come to what that means, but it described exactly what I was experiencing with the innovation champions, as well as I had gathered these, I call it the global entrepreneur salon. I didn't have a word for it at the time. I had all of these executives in a community and the same thing was playing out there. And so now we can go back to the slides and I'll talk about when I understood what a catalyst was, it changed everything. So if we look at the normal change curve from the diffusions of innovation, we have innovators on the left and the early adopters and sort of everyone else. If you're working with a lot of management consultant firms, they'll just come in and they'll be like, here's the change management process. Everyone needs to adopt it. Not paying attention to the fact that some people are stoked about it and some people would rather like go back to bed. Um, and so what we know from our research is that we kind of use the word catalyst because not everyone is specifically innovating. They're in lots of different roles, as you'll see. But any given organization has between 5 and 11% of catalysts. And so the goal is to identify these catalysts in your, in your sort of minimalist thing. If you can just identify these people, you heard my story. It was that 30% at Vodafone that were really delivering all those results. If I could have doubled that 30%, I think I would have 10 x the impact for the organization. And so the goal is to identify them, activate them, and then give them the skills to bring the early adopters along to take out a lot of that resistance that we know happens. So what is a catalyst? You guys know the classical definition. It's a person or a thing or event that quickly causes a change or an action. Our definition is that they're change makers with this unstoppable drive to action, brimming with ideas to make the world better. The things that we get called <laughs> Are, we'll embrace them. We'll be like, yeah, I'm a disruptor and a troublemaker, but they're not always meant sort of like from the kindness of people's hearts. Sometimes we are just disruptors and troublemakers, right? Uh, we can be accelerators, change makers, et cetera. What's interesting about the research is if you look at the picture on the right-hand side first, the innovation champion program was made up broadly of change agents. They were people who raised their hand. They were excited about it. I don't want to say that they weren't doing things. They just weren't doing things as fast or you know, with as much impact as the smaller subset. And the smaller subset is the ones that we call catalysts. It's not an option, like people can choose to be a change agent. We haven't done the longitudinal research about whether catalysts are born, or, you know, the nature or nurture argument, but at some point in your life, this becomes a way of moving through the world and you can't help yourself. That move fast, break shit, burn out is the cycle that we go through unless we recognize that we're, we're catalysts and develop some of the skills. So the research says this is what it means to be a catalyst. You're constantly scanning uh, the, the world and connecting dots. You'll read a sci-fi book. You'll read a McKinsey report. You'll talk to your customers and your execs. And you start to see all of these possibilities that, frankly, even for catalysts can overwhelm us sometimes. I have too many things to change. And at some point, we distill on this vision has to happen. This is the vision of where our organization needs to go. This is the innovation we need to follow. If we stopped there, they'd be visionaries, but importantly, it's that drive for action that transforms, that moves us. It's like a physical imperative for us. We can't disconnect ourselves from the idea and moving it forward. The next piece is about the experimentation mindset, which I'm guessing a lot of you have, because by definition, as innovators, we're all doing net new things. So you have to show up with that. The last one's important because it's not necessarily how catalysts describe themselves. Like I'm an adrenaline junkie, so I actually like risk. Tracy's a researcher. She wants more data, et cetera. So she is sort of a more considered catalyst. But this one is about how people describe us. They're like, ooh, those women look like they're risk takers and comfortable with ambiguity, right? For us, when you tell a catalyst that, they'll be like, no, it's risky not to do this thing. That's, that's the big flip for people is like, if, if our organization doesn't embrace innovation and start to move us forward, we're, gonna, we're not going to thrive. I want to connect it to, uh, there's an amazing article that uh, I hope Sebastian can put in chat for us. It came out at the end of last year, which is about harnessing your network. So just to reinforce, like multiple places of research are landing on the same place. Uh, and these guys did a lot, sort of like looked at a bunch of research of over a thousand R&D and innovation leaders, and they came up with, you need to activate your network and the catalysts are the people that you need. They're unusually generous with their time. They're exceptionally skilled at to staying connected from people across the network, and they're always on the hunt for new ideas. And I would just add, they have that bias towards action. And so these were sort of their three recommendations, which we totally agree with. Um, so I can stop here before I go on if you have more questions, because then I'll do this build again.
Yeah, let's take a, let's take a couple of questions and comments. Um, uh, going back, Vim, who has run one of these uh, Catalyst Champion networks in the pharma industry, says, "Is minimalist innovation easier in emerging markets versus rich countries um, where companies are used to throwing lots of money at a problem?" So, like, is, are, are are you know are the U.S. and EU and other um, you know more developed perhaps economies uh, do they just kind of you know, have a bent for maximalist innovation. Let's throw money at it. Um, I think it's good to check with your executives about what their conception of innovation is. So we always come back to like alignment with expectations. That's a really big theme. Like what do your executives mean by innovation? I would argue, and this, and, and to a large extent, we did minimalist innovation at Vodafone and it was incredibly successful. I would argue if you can, with a quarter of the maximalist budget, <laughs> show more impact faster, there's no executive that's going to say no to that. They'll be like, do more of that. If they want some of the moonshots, and some companies do, there's new drivers like, you know, if you're in a consumer goods company and your product is not aligned with the impact on climate change, you might have to do some significant, almost maximalist uh, things to sort of reinvent a marketplace. That's true. But this conversation is really about where we are in this, like, you know, the economic uncertainty where leaders don't know how to lead. And so if that's true, you'll always win with the minimalist one. The minimalist one might actually buy you license to do the maximalist one at the end of the day. I mean, timeframes, you kind of touched a little bit on this earlier, but like, you know, just looking back and saying, okay, Google X was created in 2010. We're here now in 2024. And so, um, you know, is that a time frame that would align with a lot of uh, C-level exactly. leaders? Right. Maybe in the farm industry where you're used to developing drugs over 8, 10, 12 years, maybe in energy where you're used to building lots of infrastructure over that period, but That's not right. a lot of other industries. That's right. And and I would argue actually like, you know, with the, the microtization of the energy system, like even those industries are getting disrupted, right? Like we have a customer that's in the satellite industry and they they thought they had eternal timelines and then SpaceX came out of nowhere and like, oh, <laughs> whoops, not right. aligned. Okay. Right. So I'm going to um, go then One other question here I'd love to touch yeah. on. What Are there some tips you have to increase the risk appetite of your leadership before ROI proof is available? Um, I'm big on always having metrics. So uh, like the first metric we had the first year at Vodafone as an example was uh, how many C-suite people we've talked to and what they're saying. So when you're bringing an idea, uh, you know, something that you're trying to get buy-in for, and it's 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 so classical. You could be inside and have the deepest expertise and insights, but it's if it's because Shannon said so, you're not likely to get sponsorship. If it's like the top CEOs of our largest customers or you know of our top customers said that this is the direction their business is going, those things start to buy you. And so you'll you see on here like the 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 sort of the linchpin is the demonstrable and fast impact that you can articulate. I would I'd be careful though about the the um opening them up to risk. If you go back to the change curve, and if you lay in like the Kubler-Ross like relationship with grief or the trans theoretical model of change, change takes time. <laughs> and not everyone is on the same, you know, we're not literally, there's a distribution curve. So understanding where your execs are on that distribution curve. And one of the things that we, you know, counsel Catalyst to do is like, look, if you are into disruptive innovation and your CEO is to the right-hand side of that middle line, find a new job. <laughs> like you're just, you're gonna burn yourself out. You'll be able to make incremental innovation potentially, but you'll be frustrated because you'll see the, the places that you could take it that you're never gonna get support for because they just don't have that relationship with change. You're on mute, I think, Scott. I see you talking, but... Oh, I know. It has to happen at least once during every meeting or webcast. Um, let's just take one more question and then uh, and then get to... I think you have two or three last yep. slides here. Yep. Um, uh, how are you thinking about how AI is going to impact this type of work, especially as it comes to ideation and validation of ideas? Great question, Vincent. Okay. I already asked ChatGPT to marry me, and they said no. Um, but I think that chat, I think that AI in general is going to, you know, we, we start talking now outside of corporate innovation about like the number of one person, uh, unicorns that might happen. And I know Sam Altman is bullish about that. And that might be a little bit hyperbolic, but 
um, it does really decrease the barrier to entry for so much stuff. So if you're an innovation team and you're not using it on both sides, I would say on the input into your innovation process and on the output of if you're not using AI and you're, what you're actually innovating in a lot of cases, you're going to miss the boat. So I think it's massively disruptive in some cases in a good way. Now, if we talk about the existential case for humanity and singularity, we can have a different conversation about like where this is all going ultimately. But in the like short to medium term window, I think there's a lot of upside for humanity and certainly innovation teams. All right. I love that. I want to talk more about it, but let's uh, let's get through a couple more slides and then go back to Q&A. You guys have already started to ask these questions, right? So what does alignment mean? If you're not aligned with the C-suite in all of the ways that you, we were just talking about, like their appetite for innovation, um, what their experience is, is it a new one that you have to re-bring on the journey with? You guys get it. If you're not aligned with the strategy, right? Like, and too many, I've seen too many times, and I've been guilty of this myself, like if you don't know deeply the, the corporate strategy, you're you're missing you're you're gonna fail. I mean, you might get incrementally far, but you have to be aligned with the strategy. You can inform the strategy, but you have to be aligned with the strategy. And the biggest piece is culture. So, like the McKinsey, seventy percent of transformations fail. Like I would argue, that's really the biggest reason is there. You have to think deeply about the cultural context. The next one is identifying your catalyst. So when we think about the change curve, my argument is to ignite your catalyst first and then bust the silos wide open across the organization. That'll decrease the resistance, goes back to the shared language skill set, all of that. Engage your customers. I often say, like, ask for forgiveness for that one because there's a lot of salespeople who won't let you. But if you bring them the CIO of the company that they never talked to before, like, they're going to they're gonna be stoked in the end. And the focus with Catalyst and all of that on creating shared value. That is what Catalyst are really good at in that dot connecting. All of this creates momentum, right? So you get momentum to ignite the Catalyst because you have C-level support. The Catalysts are doing heroic work and bringing new ideas. And then we want the Catalyst to really quick get to what's the business impact? Is it upskilling? Is it employee engagement? So Scott, this goes back to your thing. Actually, a lot of organizations, and this is what we do with them, is identify, this becomes both a retention, a hidden talent uh, uh, endeavor, and an engagement endeavor. Uh, when you're identifying what I would call the, the most important new level of high potential people in your organizations, which are catalysts. So like one company, as an example, uh, when, we, when we curated their cohort of catalysts, the ELT, the executive said 60% of the people that we curated were hidden talent. Um, another program in just six weeks of going through the class that he was talking about saw a 13% in employee engagement. So that those actually might be reasons, but without the business impact, you're not going to get to cohort two, right? Um, but all of that gives you the momentum because then the execs are standing up and going, you increased employee engagement in a time of like the silent, the silent quitting, and you've upskilled while driving business impact, and this virtuous cycle just continues. All of this is about, you know, and this goes back to the HBR article, finding the catalysts that are, the catalysts are everywhere. There's HR catalysts, there's marketing catalysts, there's even finance and legal catalysts, believe it or not. You have to find them. And when you find them, this becomes the final accelerant of connecting them all. And I'll leave you with this, which is none of this is a straight line. So you look at that chart for <laughs> minimalist innovation going straight up. That's not how it goes. We call this the game map, right? And slowing down to just be really intentional. What have I learned? If I'm encountering resistance as I'm starting to invite new stakeholders in, did I really clarify the appetite for change at the beginning? Um, and this becomes the skill that becomes the lubricant for that momentum of, of the virtuous upward spiral. And it doesn't take a lot. These are, these are skills that you can learn in six weeks. Uh, and so with that, as uh, Scott mentioned, the class is coming up. And there's amazing companies. You get to be in partnership with catalysts from some of the world's most interesting customers or companies that have done lots of different types of innovation. Uh, I love it. Thank you for covering so much great ground, Shannon. I love that the discount code is InnoLead. Thanks for the the uh, you know uh, brand promotion there. Um, I know you've done this course several times before, five, ten times before so yes and every single class all 20 skills improve across the board it's phenomenal but i'll tell you the number one thing while that's true and it changes how people go back i mean people talk about it being a life-changing experience literally verbatim that's what they talk about 
while it makes them more effective at driving innovation in their organizations, the number one thing that they say that they love about the class, and Tracy and I don't take it personally, is being in community with catalysts from all of these different orgs and roles and, you know, industries, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, we definitely hear that at our events as well, right? It, you know, it's, I just often say, and I know you've experienced this, like working in a large organization, all the incentives are connect and talk to and spend time with other large, other people in your same organization. There's a lot of disincentives to getting outside of the campus 100%. or outside of the headquarters building. And so for people to do that online with catalyzing organizational change for people who come to our events, it's like, okay, you, you see other people have figured this out or even the reality check of no other people are having the same problem. We are, uh, you know, really? recruiting catalysts in a specific department or, you know, with a specific skill set. Um, you know, so that just having that, those benchmarks and those comparables can be really important to people. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's like also not having to play small, like, you know, so often catalysts over the years, like they just get in their box because they're told you're too loud, you're too fast, you're too much. And these are people who just get you and often encourage you, like, actually that little baby seed of, a, of an idea could be even bigger and, and lean into support. Catalysts love, as you saw in the HBR article, they love helping people. So it's a really great way to spend your time at both the events. Totally agree. I want to go back to a couple things. Um, first of all, Keith uh, wants to know about the blend of effort and time on running experiments and building stuff versus helping those non-catalyst change agents, um, you know, come along with your with your project. And I think the question is really about, you know, if you try to turn everyone into a catalyst or everyone into a supporter of your program, it eats up all your time and all you're doing is having meetings. Sometimes with people who are just never going to get off the fence and never going to, you know, give you resources, help, totally introduction to customers. It's such a great question. So we talk about that in the class. So as you're going along, you'll see. So you know, we talk about doing a listening tour at the beginning. The listening tour, you're like, okay, I have a vision. I need to do some more scanning. I need to, you know, understand the appetite for change. I need to make sure I can clearly articulate the vision that's again contextually relevant. But also what you're listening for there is what we would call a network map. And it's one of the tools we actually use in the class. And in the network map, you have to identify, obviously, like the decision makers, because if the decision maker is not on board and if that's the CEO, then why bother? Right. I mean, you could troubleshoot that resistance for a little bit, but I wouldn't do it for long. But as you're going around on this listening tour, you're identifying the supporters, the fence sitters. There's another HBR article that we can send out after that I wish I had read 20 years ago. Uh, again, about that intersection of network and change. Like if it's really disruptive change, how do you handle the, handle the fence sitters versus if it's sort of more incremental? Um, but I totally agree with you. You have to be laser focused with your time. And so all of this is just slowing down a little bit with some really like, we don't care. You could use an Excel spreadsheet or a Miro board for your network map. I don't care how you do it. But what you're paying attention to is who are the early supporters? What do I need to give them? Um, and who am I not going to waste my time on? Now, the, that HBR article that I shared here is you do have to bring in divergent thinking. You're not just going around asking everyone, do you agree with my idea? And they say yes, and you get them on the train, right? And at some point, you have to do a feedback. So we go from a listening tour to a co-creation tour to a feedback tour. The feedback tour is where you come back to the resistors and get the red flag. Like everyone in the organization, including the CEO has agreed with this. Is there any other thing that you have to say? Speak now forever, hold your peace, right? But I love that intentionally, intentionality about who you're spending time with. And as I said, this also looks linear. This looks more linear than, you know, sort of uh, the graph that I showed you, or it looks less linear than the graph that I showed you before. But there's, as you see, there's multiple loops in here. So you might have to go through that several times where you're bringing data to the next round of people. The goal is to activate, though, that early, you know, the early adopters and not do all the energy lift on your own. Love it. Um, thanks for for tackling that question. Uh, there's also a question, and I'd love to put this back to you, Vim, about what are this, what are some specific minimalist innovation skills? Um, it does seem like there's kind of an overlap here when we talk about lean startup, when we talk about you know, prototype, don't PowerPoint, um, you know, just all of the ideas around how do you put something in front of a, you know, build build something you could put in front of a customer and potentially get some early data and early revenue that, you know, those practices go by lots of different names. Uh, I, I agree totally. So like obviously have experience with a lot of different innovation methodologies. I think for me, 
the, I, and I mentioned this before, just the shift in mindset, which is connected to those things. And you, if you're working with them, you may have already embraced, but this isn't a, it isn't a program. It isn't a methodology. There's not really specific tools as you hear. It's this, it's just slowing down a little bit and, and bringing the intentionality to read the room, right. And make sure at every point that you're you're starting to get enough data points to make that virtuous momentous circle go around. I've seen innovation teams, ours included back in the day, be like lean startup and we'd bring it into the Vodafone office and then we might train our hundred innovation champions on it, but it wasn't getting, it wasn't crossing the chasm into the rest of the organization, right? Or we weren't doing it aligned enough with either the strategy, the CEO or the culture, frankly. So these are also just learnings for me of like, this, the human element I talk a lot about, we have to do the emotional labor of change um, and bringing that intentionality with you without burning out. I love the last question is one of the differentiators for me. Um, maybe one last thing to touch on just because Vincent brought up AI earlier. I think there may be two dimensions of AI to discuss. Like, first of all, AI tools are amazing if you're focused on minimal minimalist innovation, right? It's like, okay, I can go to, you know, a free or inexpensive site that's going to design a logo for me or design a wireframe of my mobile app or, you know, create code using GitHub Copilot, right? So it feels like, man, there's a whole bunch of free open source and just low cost SaaS tools for building stuff. Um, but the other thing is like when you, uh, maybe we'll bring back the slide, you know, uh, of early adopters and innovators and the majority. I mean, I actually think that you're dealing with some really interesting anxiety and people management issues once you start bringing in AI in a big way into large organizations, right? Because this is not just, here's another piece of software that we want you to learn, or we've decided we're gonna do expense reports in a different way, right? Which is a typical change curve experience. This is like, these are tools that are potentially either gonna you know, force people to hire at a slower pace or maybe manage smaller teams. You know, it's very much a do more with less technology. I think some people worry about like, you know, am I creating a data set or am I training an AI that's going to take over my job? So like, 100%. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how you, how you see AI kind of being absorbed in companies and maybe creating some different issues, um, you know, around change management. Yeah. Uh... I, I would argue it's not really different. We've been through this cycle, like the industrial revolution and the, you know, access to the internet and then the digital transformation. So it's not like jobs being at risk for, because of new technologies is new to humanity. I would argue the scale and the speed of it is part of, um, is part of what causes a lot of the fear, partly because, <clears throat> There isn't a lot of time for the reskilling or the landing in a new in a new area, right? And it's so funny. Like I did a Catalyst happy hour when I was in Berlin, and we had a couple of creatives there. And I was arguing, I was like, one of the places that it's going to be most impacted fast, exactly to your example, Scott, is that. And they're like, no, they're not really creative. They're just they're increasing like BS metrics on LinkedIn, blah blah. blah. The next night, I went to a dinner, and this guy was a creative, and he's like, I've, "I've completely pivoted. I'm helping startup people land in Berlin because, like, my 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 clientele has gone away, like overnight." I think you have to recognize whatever the change is, you have to recognize the emotional journey that people are going on. So whether that's AI or just the layoffs because people were in this moment of transition because the macro economy, the more that you can bring your human centered approach, your empathy, um, and yeah, help people think through the process. There's no magic bullet. People are going to lose jobs. That's true. Like hiding that fact is not going to get you anywhere. People won't believe you and you'll be, you know, not invited to the next conversation. I think, you know, as innovation leaders, we have to bring that empathy and have open conversations about what that means for the organization and what the opportunities are. Um, there's a great question. Fabian has posted a lot of great questions and comments in the Thanks, chat. Fabian. And, and so I want to just take this last one, because I think it's a really good one, doing a bit of foresight work, would you envision AI agents acting as catalysts or teaming with them? Like, uh, is, can a catalyst team potentially be an AI human hybrid? Uh, 
I do think that that's going to be like, not just for Catalyst, I think we're going to have AI augmentation for the things that we do. It makes us, makes everything faster, better, cheaper. If you guys know sort of like the outputs you get from traditional search engines versus some of the new ones, like it's just, it's help, it's more helpful, right? Um, the, the important part, and this is an interesting thing for Catalyst is the emotional reaction to change that I spent so much time talking about is not going away. So until we have our AI overlords, which may happen, um, we have to bring, we have to engage people on this emotional journey. And I think that's the value. So doing the dot connecting, um, coming up with the format for your workshop, like there's a lot of inputs that you can do, but you sitting down with the people uh, you know, who are in charge, first of all, understanding the C-suite's appetite for change, that's an inherently human thing that I think is going to take a long time, if ever, for AI to catch up with us. So I think that emotional labor of change uh, will increasingly be the role of catalysts, and, and we need to not burn out doing it. What are I your thoughts, it. Scott? I want to hear, hear your answer to that. Well, no, I think we're on the precipice of a really big you know, a really big change in how innovation gets done. And also as Fabian is suggesting, like how people manage teams and form teams. And um, every day there's something that stretches your brain in a different way, you know, where someone shows you like, hey, I've chained together these four AI tools and one is fact checking the other and the other is going out to the internet and the other is designing everything into a PowerPoint. I mean, so, so A, I feel like giving people the time to keep up to speed with it. And yeah. not, you know, this is a constant challenge with innovation, right? Not keeping people so busy that they have no absorption capacity or no time to experiment um, with the tools, because this is just a very, very fast moving time. And then the other thing which we put up on our website and we did uh, we did a webcast a week or two ago is this AI vision map that we created. And the vision map is really just a discussion document intended to get organizations thinking about where do we want to be on the other side of this? right? Like there's a lot of yeah. tools you could be deploying. <clears throat> there's a lot of risk governance work you could be doing, but like really creating a vision of what is our organization going to look like on the other side of this? And I think that having that conversation helps you reassure humans, um, unless you want to be a vending machine, fully automated organization where, right. you know, your totally. employees yeah. are robots serving the coffee at Starbucks. Um, you know, it really helps people see that like, hey, there is a role for humans here in the future. And here's what we think it's going to be, as opposed to just letting people swim in all this uncertainty and anxiety for the next two or three years. And one day they get called into the meeting that says, you know, you're going to be open, hashtag open for work tomorrow. <laughs> uh, or, you know, or the other kind of meeting, which is like, you're going to be managing a fully, you know, uh, much smaller team that's going to be AI enabled. So, I definitely think it's a, you know, as you said, really, really wonderfully, it's a, you know, it's a challenging time for leaders. I would just add on that. I think there's, I mean, and and I'm not naive about the impact of AI from an energy consumption perspective, and we have to figure that out. And you can track Sam Altman's investment in energy production as well. Like he, he gets it. But I do think as humanity, we're, we're faced with such monumental challenges that having more tools at our disposal that can help us with more systemic approaches is super valuable. And that dot connecting that is like, you know, obviously exponentially more than we can do that AI can help us with. And then combining that with like, and then it can create a business plan, you know? I mean, so I, I'm actually, I'm optimistic about us being able to put a tool to good use for humanity. Yes. There's a lot more to talk about, I think, because, um, you know, large organizations are going to have a different um, adoption rate than startups, you know, where they're building on a purely, um, you know, on a fresh tech stack with a white sheet of paper, right? And they can absorb totally um, all kinds of open source and, and SaaS tools much quicker than large companies. So, you know, for folks who work in or work with large companies, <laughs> um, there's a lot of work to be done. I think that's um, true, especially in regulated industries. But I'll just say the iPhone was a perfect example of people are like, consumerization is never going to hit. Security is too important in the enterprise. And look at where we are today. So I think it's an, yeah. it's an overcomable obstacle. Yes, that's a iPhone is a great example. Um, Shannon, thanks so much to you and your so team fun. for helping put together this event. Um, a couple last things. First of all, uh, if you've been here participating, asking questions, watching, uh, you can tag someone in a comment and they will see the video replay on LinkedIn. It's part of the magic of the LinkedIn algorithm. 
Uh, as we mentioned, the next Catalyzing Organizational Change course starts on April 18th, which is coming up really soon. Uh, Shannon's book with Tracy Lovejoy is called Move Fast, Break Shit, Burn Out, The Catalyst's Guide to Working Well. Uh, their website is catalystconstellations.com. And if you're interested to find out more about InnoLead and our community of corporate innovators and change makers, we're InnoLead.com. And our next in-person event, uh, happens May 16th in Sunnyvale, California, uh, which some people call Silicon Valley. Some people call South Bay. I don't know. What do you call Sunnyvale, Shannon? It's all Silicon Valley. I'm just, I, don't, I don't need to split hairs. All right. Silicon Valley, like until you get down to Gilroy and Monterey, yeah, and then it's totally. like a whole other whole other, other thing. thing. Yeah. Um, and let's see. I think we can probably figure out, Rebecca wants to know, can we share today's deck with the audience? I think we probably could figure out a way yeah. to add the add the PDF as a comment here on LinkedIn. So thanks for Absolutely. asking. Absolutely. Thanks for asking. And, thanks and please connect on LinkedIn. Love to connect with you. Thanks, Scott. This was a super fun conversation. Thanks for the time and uh, great to see everyone. Thanks for all the great comments.